What does it take to compete in the U.S. Pro Championship? Find out on Saturday, September 3rd at a special screening of the epic film Pro at Wheeler Hall at UC Berkeley. Come meet some of the pros of Pro, including Mike Sayers and Eric Saunders. Tickets are just $10 and all proceeds benefit the NorCal High School Mountain Bike League. Get your tickets today. Visit www.norcalmtb.org or call 510-325-6502. Join us September 3rd at 7 p.m. for Pro and get prime for the San Francisco Grand Prix. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 o'clock. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. <laughs> The Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is Adrienne Fitch Frankel. This week has been filled with devastating stories of the suffering and devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Many environmentalists view this hurricane, as well as the deadly tsunami that hit in Indonesia and India in December, as worrying signs of the increasing effects of climate change. However, last week, the courthouse doors were opened for the first time by parties who claim that they have been economically harmed by climate change. Several cities and business owners have sued two federal agencies, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, also known as OPIC, and the Export-Import Bank, also known as the XM Bank, for pouring billions of dollars into fossil fuel projects that have contributed to global warming, which has caused them economic harm. With us to talk about the case are Ron Shems, an attorney who has worked on the case, and two of the plaintiffs, Arthur Berndt, a maple syrup producer from Vermont, and Mark Andre, Deputy Director of Environmental Services for the city of Arcata, California. Right now we're getting those folks on the phone. Um, let me just check and see if any are with us yet. Ar- oh, okay. We have uh, uh, Arthur and Mark. Welcome to the program. Hello. Um, nice to be with you. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start out with a couple questions for Arthur. Um, can you tell us about Maverick Farm? Well, we're one of the largest maple syrup producers in Vermont. We have about 16,000 trees, which we uh, probably have about 20,000 taps in those trees. And it's a very important, you know, the whole climate warming is a very important issue for us. Okay. And um, how exactly will climate change affect uh, maple syrup production? Well, what we've seen is although we've increased our uh, the number of taps that we have and we've increased the methodology by which we tap, we've not, we're really not seeing our production increase anymore. And what we're seeing over the last several years, and, and particularly this year, is we're seeing difficulty with the trees regenerating in the, in the forest. They start to come up a couple of feet and then uh, appear to die back. And there's also dieback in the tops of the other maples, and this year in particular, we've been hit very hard with uh, forest tent caterpillar, and then some areas have gotten uh, scale, and now we're uh, having sort of a, a late-season episode of anthracnose or uh, blight. And these things aren't unusual to uh, occur in a normal forest habitat, but I think what happens is as the climate uh, continues to warm up, we see that the populations of these kinds of things increase, and then they only further stress out the, the uh, forest. So you, uh, so how long have you been in the maple syrup business, and uh, and are you saying that this is a change from uh, the past? We've been in it about 18 years, and we're just seeing um, a general degradation of the conditions that would be best for maples. Okay, explain how you believe. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> what will you? Uh, what will you have to do if these uh, trends continue? Like, how will it impact your your business choices? 
Well, long term, I mean, it's really a long term impact. It's whether it's measured, not going to be tomorrow. We're not going to have the uh, maples aren't just going to stop producing sap. What you're going to see is a, a decline, and the question is how fast is the decline? We know that the uh, prime habitat and environment for maple trees is moving further north, so as that occurs, then hickories and other oak trees will come into this area, and it will affect not just us but all other maple syrup producers. It will affect tourism in the whole entire northeast, which depends so much on the fall foliage. Do you think that ultimately you might have to uh, close up your business? or? Well, it's hard to say. Again, uh, you could compare it to the whole issue about Katrina, which was that the writing was on the wall for some issues based on the uh, you know disappearing wetlands and the levees, and we have a lot of evidence here, and we don't know. Uh, you know, it's not a question of if there's global warming; it's a question of when are we going to have irreversible effects of global warming, and that's really uh, the question here. We don't think. It may not happen in two years or five years, but we know it's going to happen in 10 or 20 or 30. Okay. I have some questions for Mark now. What effects could climate change have on the city of Arcata? Well, Arcata is a coastal city um, located right on Humboldt Bay, and um, we have a lot of low-lying areas, in- including uh, assets such as our wastewater treatment plant that are uh, not far above sea level currently. And um, so... In an area such as ours that receives a lot of rainfall in the winter and uh, coinciding with high tides, the flooding is a, is a problem that we see as a potential uh, aggravation by um, sea level rise, primarily due to climate change. Um, a lot of our tourism in the area is focused on uh, salmon fishing, and sea level rise or sea temperature rise is also a problem regionally with, with the uh, the salmon industry, and um, we also have ag- agricultural lands and oyster beds in and around Arcata that, that could all be affected by um, a rise in sea level. Okay. So we've modeled we modeled the what if scenarios and, and the trends um, do concern us. How will Arcata cope with these changes in a in a worst case or bad case scenario? Well, over time, you know. Um, it would cause uh, us to either move move some of these assets, these public facilities, um, which would be very expensive, or, or to, build lev- to build levees. And we do have a five-mile levee on North Humboldt Bay right now, which was built in 1890, which um, is in very poor condition. It's, it's only in part owned by the city of Arcata, but it's already suffering from uh, um, degradation, um, high tides, etc. So... We don't look forward to having to um, put levees on, on Arcata, but in any coastal city um, or island nation or island uh, where there's a population probably has a concern with, with sea level rise. And um, for us, it's coinciding with a high tide and a storm event when we have a lot of um, flooding from rainfall. So, I hear you mentioning several times levees and flooding and whatnot. Was this as much a part of the of the dialogue or concern uh, before a week ago with uh, New Orleans, or um, is this is this a constant concern that's been uh, a part of the Arcata political scene for a while? Um, well, you can read my deposition, which was February uh, 2005, and I think in November 2004. So that was the, the focal part of my. Um, concerns representing the city of Arcata. Um, so it, it, it wasn't a, a new concern based on the, the hurricane. So, um, like I said, it would for a small town like Arcata to move its wastewater plant upstream would be uh, cost prohibitive. Even if we were to levy the, the city in from high tides, we have five um, urban streams which, which have to make it to the bay. So um, flooding that we currently have that we've been trying to work on uh, um, dealing with would, would just be aggravated over time. So th- those are the primary concerns. Okay. Uh, Ron, I understand that you've joined us. Uh, yes, I have. Thank you. Okay. This is Ron Shems, who is um, one of the, the attorneys who's worked uh, on behalf of the plaintiffs. Um, the legal claim these plaintiffs are making is that OPIC and XM have violated the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Could you explain to us what NEPA requires? NEPA requires federal agencies to assess the environmental impacts of their actions and to take a hard look at those impacts 
um, as well as a hard look at alternatives and mitigation prior to making any decision that could have some environmental impact. Okay, so um, does it actually require uh, that the uh, that the defendant in such a lawsuit? Or, I'm sorry, that the uh, that that uh, federal agencies um, would do something, or it just uh, do something uh, policy wise, or other than a, than environmental impact statement, or, or does it only require an environmental impact statement? Well, it requires not just compiling an environmental impact statement, but it requires the agency to take a hard look at the impacts, at alternatives, and at mitigation in the hope that information will will force action. Okay. So um, for our listeners, when you say that they we need to take a hard look at it, what, is, what does that mean? It means that they have, in making a decision to proceed with a particular project, they have to demonstrate that they've accounted for and looked at all of the impacts and that this is a decision they want to make in light of the impacts and in light of assessment of alternatives and mitigation. Okay. And the defen- defendants in this lawsuit are OPIC and XM. C- could you please tell us in a sentence or two what each of these federal agencies do? Um, they both will provide financing to U.S. companies that either sell products or services for overseas projects or will directly finance the overseas projects if American companies are working on them. Uh, Those types of projects include um, oil field development, building of pipelines, building of power plants, as well as a host of other uh, non-power related projects. And how have OPIC and XM failed to live up to NEPA? Um, They haven't complied with it. They they just never applied it. Um, And it's our claim that they have never applied it at all to to power projects. Okay, so what you're saying is that they've never done an uh, environmental impact statement for their, um, for the work that they do. That's correct. All right. And um, so what are the plaintiffs actually asking for? What type of relief? Uh, We're asking for a declaration stating that they violated NEPA and an injunction ordering them to comply with NEPA from here on in. Okay. Um, so if, uh, if you get an injunction, um, can you just uh, tell the listeners what an injunction would do? What is an injunction? An injunction is it's a court order saying from here on in you have to do the following, and in this case, assuming we, we win, um, the following would be to comply with NEPA. And NEPA and what NEPA requires in the case of climate change is, is very, very important. Uh, it's this, these two agencies are responsible um, either directly or indirectly for approximately 8% of worldwide annual emissions um, of greenhouse gases. And that's a staggering amount. It's the equivalent to approximately one-third of the annual U.S. emissions. And assessing the impacts of projects that, are, uh, that cause these emissions and looking at alternatives and looking at mitigation, and it, it, w- it will be the first step to getting a grip on climate change. Okay. Um, so last week the plaintiffs got, quote-unquote, standing in that case. What does that mean? Um, in order to go into court, you have to have what's known as standing. And the, the probably the simplest way to explain it is that if somebody dents your car, I can't sue that person because I haven't been injured. Only you can because you've been injured uh, by, through the dent in your car. Um, what this decision held is that the plaintiffs in this case, the cities and the members of Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, have demonstrated that they are suffering some type of injury uh, that's legally cognizable and legally sufficient to open the doors of the federal courts to address the issue of climate change. All right. And uh, does this uh, suit open the, the courthouse door for other parties who might be injured by climate change? Like, for example, could the city of New Orleans, uh, you know, join this suit or um, otherwise sue someone for damages incurred by Hurricane Katrina? Well, each, each plaintiff is taken on a, on a case-by-case basis. Um, but if, if New Orleans can demonstrate some type of injury that it suffered because of climate change, and, and certainly there are uh, lots of reports saying that uh, global warming probably conti- uh, contributed significantly to the, uh, 
to the intensity of the storm uh, plus the, le- the sea level rise, uh, which contributed to the, to the storm surge. Um, they, this case wouldn't say New Orleans can, but this case would set a precedent to say that the, that would help be helpful for New Orleans if they wanted to do that. Okay, and uh, let me uh, give you the station break here for a moment. This is Adrienne Fitch-Frankel, and you're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Today we're talking with attorney Ron Shems, Arthur Berndt of Maverick Farms in Vermont, and Mark Andre of the city of Arcata. So um, you, you mentioned a precedent. What does it, what does it mean if uh, you know if a, if a, if there's a legal precedent? A precedent means essentially paving the way to say that um, legally it's okay to do a certain thing. All right, and. Um, Let's compare this. Um, you know, we've we've said a moment ago that um, that you know, or we were talking about whether this opens the courthouse door. I understand that this this uh, outcome is a first in some ways. How is this um, decision a, a first in the field of uh, lawsuits related to climate change? Um, to my knowledge, this is the first case that that holds that climate change provides some type of if injury or sufficient injury. Uh, to allow standing or to open the courthouse doors. Okay. Are there other um, uh, lawsuits in the pipeline on climate change issues? Um, there are. There are a few. Um, one is a case brought by several uh, northeastern states and cities uh, in down in New York City, um, where they've sued mis- Midwestern power plants for emitting greenhouse gases. They're claiming a, a nuisance. Um, another case is a case decided not too long ago by the Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., uh, which addressed standing but didn't make any decisions uh, relating to standing. So um, can you compare the lawsuit that you've uh, helped facilitate um, to these other lawsuits? What would, what would be the outcomes or the remedies in these other lawsuits? Um, the one in the Court of Appeals in, in Washington, the plaintiffs were seeking to have EPA control carbon dioxide as a pollutant uh, under the Clean Air Act, so to impose limitations that way. Um, the case in New York, it's still in its infancy, and there the states are uh, seeking damages and, um, and an injunction, a limitation on greenhouse gas emissions from uh, Midwestern power plants. So this suit that's uh, suing for nuisance, um, first of all, what is nuisance, and uh, would they actually get some money from a uh, money type of rem- remedy? Um, I don't. I can't predict the, the outcome of the litigation. Um, the uh, nuisance is it's it's claiming some widespread harm okay. uh, that that has a that has a public impact. So. Now our listeners know all about this uh, this climate change lawsuit, precedent-setting lawsuit. Um, let's go back to our plaintiffs for a minute and uh, and talk about um, you know some of the, the issues surrounding the lawsuit. Um, first of all, uh, I have a, a quote here from Rush Limbaugh. Um, he stated on his radio program on August 25th. Um, he was talking about how a bunch of wacko groups have been given standing by this judge to sue. And uh, I was wondering, um, Mark, are you still there? Hello? Mark, are you on the line? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I was wondering how a city like Arcata or the other three uh, cities on this lawsuit feel about being called a bunch of wacko groups. Well, we don't necessarily uh, agree with that. Um Arcata is um, part of a global network of 470 other local governments who've, uh, actually it's called ICLEI, I-C-L-E-I, um, I think .org is the, the website. But basically um, it's an association of governments worldwide that have banded together to um, work hard at our local level to um, decrease carbon dioxide emissions and install renewable energy facilities. Um, local governments aren't providing the leadership here, mainly because in, in, in this country there's a lack of leadership at the federal level. So um, we're, we don't consider ourselves wacko. We're, we're, we're prudent and um, 
I think radical would, would be, you know, proceeding without measuring or thinking about the potential impacts of your actions would, would be more of a wacko um, category for, from our perspective. We also have developed our own greenhouse gas um, reduction plan at the city, and um, it's pretty um, rigorous. By the year 2010, uh, we've committed to reduce our greenhouse gases in the city by 20% below the year 2000 levels, so we have a plan in place. It's a challenge, but it's doable and it's achievable. And um, like I said, it's it's uh, a lot of other cities are working towards the same goal. Leadership at the federal level would help in a lot of ways. Um, um, for example, stimulating the renewable energy technology sector would would likely decrease the the cost for for these alternative energies. Um, as a city, how do you choose? You've mentioned a couple of strategies your city is taking to um, head off the prospect of impacts from global warming. Um, we know that you're a member of ICLE, that you're uh, taking other steps, and that you're a part of this lawsuit. And so how does a city choose the steps it's going to take, um, and, and uh, how do you uh, d- decide to to fit a lawsuit like this into your overall strategy to address the the threat of climate change well our concern and and our um, participation in the lawsuit is consistent with the city's policies to um, provide for sustainable development and to reduce our our impacts of greenhouse gases Um, we've read a lot of the science involved and and it's pretty overwhelmingly convinced us that um, there's a reason to be concerned. So being party to this lawsuit is, is just consistent with our policies that we've had for quite a while. And um, Arthur, uh, as a business person, uh, I'd like to ask you the same question. Are you still there? Arthur? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, great. Um, so how do you see, how do you create a full strategy as a business, uh, as a small business um, in addressing uh, global climate change and in an industry that could be affected by climate change? Um, and, you know, how does, uh, how does being involved uh, in an environmental lawsuit uh, fit into that overall strategy? Well, I think the overall strategy would try, to, I mean, it's our goal to be a sustainable farm and have sustainable production so that we don't destroy the resources that we use. I think that's becoming more and more the conventional wisdom with forestry and, and uh, agricultural practices, and I think that would be uh, important to, con- to build upon. All right. As another question for both Arthur and Mark, um, starting with Arthur. Uh, on a big picture level, what do you hope will happen as a result of this lawsuit? Well, I would just hope that we have some policy change, and I think that's the most important thing in, in my mind is that the rest of the world acknowledges that there's cli- climate warming, and this administration in particular wants to deny that, and I think uh, everyone knows that knows that, that occurs, and we need to accept it, and I think as being leaders of the world, America is a leader in the world, we need to uh, show that by leading our way through climate change issues. Could you specify the exact type of policy change that you foresee? Well, I think if, the, if, they, if, if, uh, if we won this case, as uh, Ron had uh, you know, suggested that the, one, of the, one of the outcomes would be that they would have to, that XM and OPEC would have to adhere to standards of NEPA, which are uh, pretty minimal standards, but which guide us here in the United States. So we shouldn't outsource, um, ish, you know, outsource production and allow capital to move offshore in ways that harm the, the climate and other people around the world. We need to be responsible. We need to, we need to show that we are leaders. Um. Mark, could you also answer the same question about on a big picture level? What, what would you hope will happen as a result of this lawsuit? Well, I, I hope uh, that the NEPA process has, is adhered to, and mainly because it will disclose impacts and uh, hopefully result in more intelligent choices being made. Um, um, this is a foreign policy uh, branch of the, the U.S. government that, that can have quite a bit of positive influence if. if uh, if it's used correctly and, and that if the impacts are known, um, I think people might make better choices. All right. Uh, Ron, let's go back to you. What, um, what are the possible results of this uh, lawsuit in, from your perspective? Well, you know, from a practical perspective, we have two federal agencies that most folks haven't even heard of. You know, everyone's heard of EPA or, or the Department of 
um, national parks or the interior. But no one's heard of these two agencies, but yet they're responsible for a huge chunk of the greenhouse gas emissions. And so bringing to light what's actually going on, and it's essentially following the money, uh, because these are agencies that provide financing to large companies such as ExxonMobil and Halliburton um, to be able to pursue fossil fuel projects. That's, that's a, a practical way of starting to get a grip on, on climate change, to, to expose what's going on, to assess what's going on, and to, to assess mitigation and alternatives to what's going on. And getting a handle on this is really, the, I think, the most important first step to uh, addressing the problem of climate change. Do you, do you think that uh, there are also some, aside from the specific um, possible outcomes of this lawsuit, do you think that this uh, might open the door to other um, NEPA-related uh, lawsuits on climate change issues for other specific federal agencies? Um, I would hope so, yes. Um, examples would include you know, building of highways and to take into account the contribution uh, of greenhouse gas emissions or to climate change um, made by highways and the resulting increase in, in traffic. What's the next stage for this lawsuit? The next stage will be to determine whether or not these agencies, by never having applied NEPA, uh, violated NEPA. And you determine that by um, the standard is whether or not uh, climate change is a reasonably probable impact of financing fossil fuel projects. All right. And so, um, and so back to court. Yes. Um, it will be argued on February 10th, that question. All right. 2006. So our listeners can stay tuned to their, uh, to their other media sources. Um, if, uh, so what if the court finds that NEPA does not apply to OPEC and XM? What law does apply? Does any law apply to OPEC and XM with regard to the environment? Um, there are laws that require them to perform environmental assessments, um, but they've never used that law to um, assess climate change. They've used those laws mostly to determine impacts on, on the host country of particular projects. All right. Uh, it's about time for us to start wrapping up this show. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me give you, uh, the audience, a, a website uh, that you can go to to learn more about this website, uh, I'm sorry, about this uh, lawsuit and, um, and the plaintiffs. Uh, it is www.climatelawsuit.org. That's www.climatelawsuit.org. And uh, closing in on the, on the end of the show, the, thanks to Ron, Mark, and Arthur for being with us and to Erica Bridgman for being our engineer. More information on this lawsuit can be found at or are you, sorry, uh, www.climatelawsuit.org. And before signing off, I do want to make a quick announcement or two. Um, uh, first of all, from the Blue Water Network in San Francisco, um, they invite you to, come to, to help cool down global warming by coming to an unforgettable event Cirque Blue on September 16th from 7 p.m. to midnight at Broadway Studios in San Francisco. So that was September 16th. Enjoy top-notch circus performances, live music, and a silent auction. All proceeds will support Blue Water's cutting-edge campaign to reduce green, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. To reserve your tickets, call 415-544-0790, extension 12. Let me repeat that. 415-544-0790, extension 12. I want to make one other quick announcement. Um, there's going to be a mercury thermometer exchange on sub Sunday, September 11th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Solano Stroll. That was Sunday, September 11th. Bring your uh, ther uh, mercury thermometers enclosed in two Ziploc bags, and they will give you one free digital thermometer in exchange at the Save the Bay booth. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great weekend. Ava Gollinger, acclaimed author of the Chavez Code, Cracking U.S. Intervention in Venezuela, 
Ava will be the speaker at the annual fundraising dinner for the Marin Interfaith Task Force on the Americas, Saturday, September 3rd, at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation.